really excited to be here with you all. Thanks for taking time out of your evening to come to what we hope is a very productive and informative uh, session on developer communities uh, for you all. It's, uh, it's really exciting for me to spend time with some pretty amazing people in the community space. The panel that I have up here, colleagues in the space and even friends. Uh, so you'll get a lively discussion and hopefully a lot of information that you can take back and help you make decisions as you build out your own developer communities. Uh, my name is Jesse Davis. Um, I run a development team, head of product at a company called Devada. It's funny, I started out my career as a developer and developed software for a long time. And recently I get to wake up every day and help the lives of developers all over the world better by building great communities. And I hope to share some of that information experience with you tonight. Uh, really excited to be moderating this panel. And instead of me introducing everyone, I'd like for them to introduce themselves. Uh, so we'll start with Tama O. If you'll just give a brief introduction yourself and uh, get to know the audience. Hi, my name is Tama O Nakahara, and uh, I currently run a developer experience team at a startup called Weave.Works. We're in the Kubernetes space. Um, if we go far back, I started out in the partner space at VMware, but I was kind of a scrappy person who discovered this thing called Oracle User Group. So that's kind of my first touch into how certain communities did grassroots stuff. Uh, and then at VMware, they acquired a company called Spring Source, uh, and mm -hmm. so then created the first DevRel team around Cloud Foundry and Spring, and I signed up day one. I was like, oh my God, what is this thing? And then kind of got obsessed with that and how that worked and how I just felt really attached to it. Um, and then uh, we got spun off into Pivotal with a lot of the open source bits that were there. So you might know RabbitMQ, Re um, Redis, um, Grooving Grails, of course, Spring and Cloud Foundry and others. Uh, and then after that, um, I was at New Relic and so ran a developer relations team, kind of more in a marketing org. And now developer experience kind of brings all these different pieces together because we're very much a team that spends a lot of our time contributing to the Kubernetes space and then building our own open source projects. So kind of a, a wide range of developer marketing through open source, through product stuff. So if you want to ask me of any of those, I'm happy to help. Awesome. Okay. I'm Dave Nugent. Uh, I work for IBM as a developer advocate, and I also run the SF JavaScript Meetup and ForwardJS conferences. But yeah, excited to be on the panel. All right, I'm Mike Stowe. Uh, I have no idea what my official title is at Ring Central. I stopped counting after like the first four words. Check your business card. My business card. Uh, so I run uh, Ring Central's uh, developer marketing program. Uh, before that, I started off as an engineer. So I was an engineer for about 15 years. Uh, and a lot of people use the term like self-taught developer. I like the term community-taught developer because I made way too many mistakes to be self-taught and the community really bailed me out. Uh, or so I thought, uh, after 15 years, people saw my code in production, yay, and said go to marketing. Uh, so <laughs> here I am. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, great team uh, this evening for y'all. A lot of experience and community. And so hope, hopefully uh, we'll get into some of the specific questions. And if not, like Mina said, we'll have Q&A at the end. And then we'll also be able to go out and meet each of you individually afterwards and hopefully get to the questions if you have them um, that are burning. But I wanted to start off, um, as we think about community, it's funny to consider what is community, right? There are many different aspects of it. And, you know, whenever I think about community, I think about the human aspect. We're trying to bring humans together, connection, right? Building places where people belong. Um, and so, you know, as we get started, you know, what when you define community, just in a few words, what do you think community is? And Mike, why don't we start with you and come back this way? Uh, wow, you just started the tough question right off the bat. Uh, I think community can be summed up in one word, and that is relationships. Uh, community is this right here. It's a chance for people to get together, talk about things that they're interested in, share their interests, bond with each other, uh, and move forward together as a uh, single organism. Cool. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Um, my interest in community has always really been on the in-person side of things. Mm -hmm. I know that it can be really powerful online, but as a conference organizer and a meetup organizer, I really value those personal relationships that you sort of get in an in-person gathering. Yeah. Um, to piggyback on all those, as I mentioned, I had been involved in product user groups and open source community groups, and I feel like the thing that feels most meaningful is uh, people wanting to come together to um, discuss and help each other around certain topic areas where maybe they don't really get that in their workplace mm -hmm. um, or build together on something where they don't feel like um, they can get the financial support to do that. So sometimes it's, it's that personal meaning that comes out of those different interactions as well. Awesome. Some good definitions. You know, when, when someone is beginning to think about building a community, at what stage should they, should they think about building the community? And right, What are those steps that they have to start to be able to do such a thing. Tell me, why don't you go first? Um, 
I would start with finding out where the communities are happening organically. I, I think we've maybe all had a, an experience where we feel like we're kind of brute forcing the creation of a community or we feel like there's a business need. And uh, I just feel in my personal experience, it's not really going to work unless it happens among people who are, you know, maybe organizing their own meetup groups already because they're just so excited about uh, an open source project that you created or they just love your product so much that they're out there tweeting about it or doing stuff and sometimes building that community is around um, uh, recognizing and then giving some um, a formal uh, relationship to what you think is happening organically. Yeah. I feel like if it comes the other way around, you're going to often have an uphill battle. Okay. Mike? Oh. oh. Um, so I think in terms of the first part of the question, at what stage do you build a community or should your business start looking at building a community? Uh, I think the question really is how much money do you want to throw away on marketing before you realize that word of mouth is the best marketing? Mm. Uh, and what I mean by that is how many people here have heard a thing called like goat yoga? Go, yeah, go, 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 go. I learned about this today. Like, I'd never heard this. <laughs> I, you know, a friend told me, again, word of mouth. How many people uh, saw the Starbucks cup in Game of Thrones? A couple people. How many people know that wasn't a Starbucks cup? They got something like $7 million worth of, I don't even know what the number is, of free marketing because of the community that they had talking about a product that wasn't even theirs. Mm. Uh, that's what community can really do is it not only you know, gives you the ability to expand your company and tell people how they're using it, but provide you feedback at the same time. So if you're saying, look, we want to go to market with this product, is it going to sell? Are people going to buy it? Going to your community, they can tell you, hey, this is great, but this doesn't work. I need to revise this. So I would start with community the very first thing. I think it's one of the first things you should do. Okay. Awesome. Dave? Well, I have a question now. What was the goat yoga thing? Oh, oh. yeah. You, you do yoga with baby goats, and they walk on you. I thought you were kidding when you said you were going to mention <laughs> it's, that. It's a real thing, thing, unfortunately. Word of mouth. Yeah. It's a real thing. But I think you had a great point about paving the cow paths of the community because I think we've all been in a situation where you, 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 know, you start up a forum or something and that's just not the way that your customers and your community members want to interact with you. I gave a presentation uh, on a topic that there were three people in the audience. So obviously that was not a topic that people in the community were responsible for responding well to. Although in my defense, that was also like a Warriors playoff game that night and the season finale of RuPaul's Drag Race. So that might have had something to Got do with it. it. <laughs> but yeah, find what your community is interested in, how they want to communicate, and double down on it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, if I could share, um, I'm sure people have heard about the instant pot phenomenon. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just think uh, what they do just makes so much sense and is really a, a huge part of their success. And I myself, like, had a rotation of every three years somehow thinking that maybe I need a pressure cooker. <laughs> and there I was. <laughs> and I literally came to it cold, like so many people. And I had two video options. I had something on YouTube by a community member who probably then was kind of paid or supported in some way as a brand ambassador. But she had a 20-minute video about the new version of the Instant Pot, all the features that they had changed based on the community and user feedback, like mm -hmm. little things like, you know, the way the lid stood and these things. And she, you know, she broke it down. And then it turned out she also has a book of recipes that if you buy an Instant Pot, like her recipes and other people's recipes are officially in this printed book and mm -hmm. not just in English and different languages. So it's just sort mm -hmm. of like, well, we didn't have time to translate, but here's, you know, these different community members. And then so I'm watching this and then the competitors um, video was a product manager, or sorry, a product marketing manager was dryly going through like stuff that meant nothing to me, that had nothing to do with what I was looking for. And so for me, it was like, you know, a clear winner. And then this whole phenomenon took off. And I just said, look, you know, that's so much of what we do. We're seeing what's happening organically. We're validating it. We're helping. We're, you know, showing thanks and, and, and making it real and part of the conversation, right? And mm -hmm. Um, you know, I can't talk enough about how amazing they are and how much we can learn and what we do from what they accomplished. Do you have one of those pots now? Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I purchased after uh, I said, look at this community member. It's, it's interesting. It's a good point that you make, um, and we'll get to some more of the details of that later, but you know, one of the, the key reasons that you have a community is to make products better, right? Capturing that feedback and being able to take action on it. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, whenever you think about other advantages, of standing up community, Mike, you specifically said as early as possible, right, in your answer. So what are some of the advantages, uh, as those in the room are thinking about standing up community, what are the advantages of standing it up early versus waiting until it's too late? I think one of the first advantages is you find out if your product really meets the community's needs. Mm. Uh, you can throw a lot of ideas out there, 
Uh, and I'll pick on myself, for example. I worked for a company or as a contractor for a company a long, long time ago where we built this uh, API. We put this API out there. We were excited. We spent like nine months building this thing. It was amazing. Uh, followed all the best practices. The code was perfect. I know because I wrote it. Um, <laughs> I don't know why people <laughs> laugh at that. Um, we put it out there, and three weeks later, we realized we had a problem. No one was using it. It didn't meet their needs. It wasn't what they wanted. So the mm. first part, it goes back to product validation. The second part is it goes back to uh, a lot of your competitors. Uh, you know, we look at uh, my past, for example, I joined a company called Constant Contact. Uh, how many people have heard of Constant Contact? <laughs> how many people ads? have heard of MailChimp? Okay. Yeah, so a little bit more hands from MailChimp. Yeah. So I had to go into the developer space to talk about Constant Contact versus MailChimp. And every way I went to was like, oh, why don't I just use MailChimp? Uh, when I went to it with another company called MuleSoft, we had to go against small companies, you know, like Informatica, Dell, Microsoft, uh, <laughs> Oracle. <laughs> Uh, companies had well-established programs, but the thing that helped us was our community. Not only did they validate the product, not only did they help us improve, uh, and we also had open source, they contribute open source, but they started being that, you know, the voice for MuleSoft, and pretty soon MuleSoft became actually the number one iPass uh, in the market, uh, and, you know, our community took a, a large, uh, large responsibility for that. Good point. I, I, you know, one of the interesting things about community also is, I don't know if it's ever really too late, but um, I think when you, when you have a product online, right, and you have people using it and they're interacting with it, a community is probably going to grow around that organically, even if you don't do anything to manage it, right? And the benefit that you get out of actively managing the community is that you get to leverage that feedback and you mm -hmm. get to set the tone and sort of impart your, your values and morals on the community and sort of help guide and, and shape it. So, um, so you can you know, that stuff is out there and it's just sort of waiting for you to, to get value out of it. I'd also add that, uh, for example, if you're starting out and nobody knows who you are, for example, the startup that I worked at, in the beginning days, it was like, some people knew our um, open source project, but uh, no one knew our brand. And we just had really smart people who were great teachers. And so I just said, let's just put this online. Let's just get these talks out there. And, you know, more and more people are just like, I never heard of you, but wow, you guys really understand Kubernetes. You really seem to know what's going on. So it was just sort of like, let's create thought leadership around the things that um, whatever this community was going to become cared about, right? We would just sort of like, hey, you're getting started. You want this information. Um, here's some best practices. Here's some information we haven't found out there. And, uh, you know, that just became a place. And then using Slack, people would just come and just come and chat with us and we were so like readily available to help you know and people might be like how do you guys make your money well, we're just helping people you know we're just trying to figure out what the need is um, and then you know your community and the community's ways of getting um, connected could be something beyond your product so when I was at New Relic I realized like oh uh, in a similar way people were like okay the brand was pretty well established by the time I joined but they were like oh you guys like you guys are just really smart your engineers are really cool you guys are doing cool stuff I want to meet people but then also when we would bring together um, uh, new relic customers they're like oh I really want to go because other new relic customers have similar problems that I have and they're also like really smart people and they're doing cool things and sometimes we would have the customers speak and like you know I really want to know how they're solving the similar problem that we have right. and so you know it's not just about like product product it's just how do you you know build something that's meaningful that people want help on yeah now you brought up an interesting topic um, use the word money and did, so, I say, did I say the word money? Yeah, you used the word money, and it, it triggered something uh, as I was thinking about it, because money, you know, is, it, it's always important uh, whenever we talk about it. It's interesting, uh, we were working with um, a customer, and they, were, they decided to build a, com a community first. And by building the community first, they didn't end up getting a ticketing system. They got the feedback from the product that we were talking about through the community mm -hmm. and offset the, the cost for the support that way. <laughs> um, but as we're talking about money... I want to ask about how do you prove value, right? As we're talking with companies getting started with community, right? If, if revenue, the word, I'll use the word revenue, uh, is an important thing, how do you prove value other than revenue? And how do you think about ROI and value on both sides of the community equation? <laughs> we'll start with Mike. So I, I think the first thing that happens when we're talking about revenue is sometimes we look at revenue and we look at money and we look at communities and we say, like, that's a bad word. We can't say money. We can't say revenue. The reality is a community has to be you know, symbiotic. It has to be something that uh, benefits your developers and your community. But the company also has to make money. Otherwise, the company is not going to be around very long to support the community. 
Uh, in terms of how do you prove value, I think there's two different types of values that you have. You have indirect value and direct value, which comes from the community. Uh, indirect value can be things uh, you kind of alluded to, support tickets, having your community, uh, community hop on and help support people so you don't have to have you know, double your support staff to manage that. Uh, as a small startup, I'm guessing you probably don't have a lot of people to write documentation. Uh, and if you've ever decided to use like an enterprise grade ESB that requires Java and you're a you know, uh, Ruby developer that just got out of uh, boot camp, probably not a great thing. We had a lot of people in our community that actually created that content, how to's tutorials. So you can look at the indirect uh, value, which is the content that your community is creating, the support your community is providing, basically the headcount that they're giving you free of charge to make your product you know, be successful. And then you can look at direct value. So if you're an API company, you can look at things and say, okay, is the API increasing things like uh, retention? Uh, are customers sticking around longer? Um, it, how is it affecting you know, the churn and how is it affecting upsell? Uh, for open source, uh, you know, if you're afraid uh, to sell to your open source community, if you can't sell to your open source community, that's a company problem, that's not a community problem. Because your open source community should be excited about the products that you're creating. They should be excited about using it. Uh, for example, as at MuleSoft, we have many people who use open source MuleSoft only because they couldn't pay $80,000 per core for MuleSoft ESB. The second they got into large enterprise companies, like, man, we should be using the enterprise version. Uh, so you can also look at what's the pipe generated from uh, the content that your, your community is creating or that you're uh, driving from the community. With that said, pipe should not be something you measure your community by. Like, don't hold it as a, a sales value because the second you do that, it becomes a bunch of leads uh, instead of, again, creating a bunch of relationships that you can work with. And developers value trust. Mm -hmm. And if, if we're talking about developer communities, which I think we are, you violate that trust once and it's gone, mm -hmm. right? So uh, anything else on, yeah, on that day? That's a really good point about trust. I, personally, I tend to be really conservative with regards to sort of like the value of community. So, you know, you don't want to have it relate directly to money, but at the same time, you kind of want to know, like, is the stuff that I'm doing actually making money for my company? Like, I want to be able to prove that at some point. And so we've actually been able to do that at a few of the startups that I've been at, where when we have events, we'll you know, ask for people's email addresses optionally. And if we create content, then we'll actually measure click-throughs to the, to the SaaS. And if you cohort out you know, the people who are attending your meetups and conferences and reading your content, then we would tend to see something you know, like between 6 or $10 in revenue for every dollar that we spent on community. Uh, and so even though that shouldn't be the primary focus, I love to sort of like use, use tactics like that in order to be able to prove it to ourselves, to our own team, and to the execs. That was a great, I, I'm pretty sure I saw three people write that down. That's a great metric. Yeah. <laughs> Anything to add? Um, so when I did more um, straightforward developer marketing, uh, you know, we would basically have uh, dev advocates and community managers uh, who would create assets and they would kind of go through more, you know, traditional like, you know, you want to touch people seven times or 14 times or whatever to the sale, yeah. you know, that's how you add value. And then, you know, more specifically, we might have dev advocates who, you know, are, are uh, thought leaders in the Java space or in the Ruby space and in the Python space. And so, you know, even though you might, it frequently happens, right? Like you have a platform or something, you're like, well, the experience should be same across all these <laughs> different language communities. You know, you have to understand that each one of them is going to connect in a different way. And if you go and say like, oh, hey, the new version of X came out and, you know, hey, this is cool about it and this is annoying, isn't it? And you can have that real, you know, authentic conversation, you're going to build that relationship better. And that's why you, you know, can often build out your teams that way. So those metrics were fairly mm -hmm. straightforward. Um, currently in our role, like I said, it's developer experience. So there's a lot more of like poking around in different directions. Um, but, you know, and, and the tools are not perfect, but I, I consider when I manage my team, you know, they're doing all these things and I'm just like making sure that it's in Salesforce, that every little mm. thing, because when you find out when these big deals come through, you know, I'm just like, well, what happened? And it'll often be like one of the steps was they came to your Slack channel and someone's really nice to them. You know, and it's just like people mm -hmm. like kind of like, I'm like, you got to notice that. Like, that is so <laughs> important because at that point, like, actually, I had a team member, uh, one of the guys reports to me was doing something in the, you know, he was t tinkering around with something in the Kubernetes space and went to a chat room. And the first person was super mean, just like talked mm. him down and said, why are you even asking these dumb questions? You know, and he's more resilient and all that. But just imagine like all the ways that someone might engage with you and that touch point is so important so you know it's my job i see it as my job to make sure that these things all get measured and and followed as much as we can because you know a lot of it's just 
quite gray. Um, and then from there, uh, yeah, I'm in a space where like we're small, we'll take money from anywhere, we're like quite creative, <laughs> and the you know, but it, it helps us have some surprises. Like you know, we kind of don't know sometimes where some things are going to go. Like you know, we will build something because we see a problem, and then it'll turn out that you know a big company decides, oh, we want to invest with in you because you're actually going to solve a much bigger problem that we didn't see. Mm. Um, we've created open source projects where a large company is like we want that to work with our thing and we're willing to pay you for it, you know? And if we were probably more established, we'd say, well, we don't really have channels for that, <laughs> but we're like, thank you, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow, like, this is how, like, DX is paying for itself. So it's kind of the wild frontier a little bit. But That's pretty cool. We covered yeah. a lot of, I mean, the use cases you covered, uh, developer marketing. Yeah. Uh, we covered developer experience. Yeah. You know, developer relations is thrown in there. You know, Mike was talking about providing value and Dave both uh, both on top line and bottom line revenue. So saving money by offsetting support and then delivering real value in terms of pipeline on the developer marketing side, you know, back to the company as well. So being able to see your pipeline and capturing that stuff in Salesforce, mm -hmm. if we can agree on one thing is that the community is a good source of data for your company. Mm -hmm. And what you can do with that data to help build what we would call a healthy and vibrant community, I want to explore that just a little bit. So when you think about that line between your community and your sales and marketing efforts, right, is there something inherently bad about selling to your community? And are there effective ways of cultivating communities that are vibrant and healthy, but are still receptive to being able to be sold or from that dev marketing side? I'd like to explore that just a little bit. It's very, um, very bad, and you should all be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yep. <laughs> I disagree. I, I, I think Mike might have a different perspective. Yeah. No, I, I think the, the important thing to remember right off the bat is it's not your community. It's their community. Uh, when you're a part of a community of people who are excited about whether it's your product or open source, you should be uh, making it very clear this is your community. We're a part of it. And so just like any community that you're part of, you don't want to cross that line and go from saying, you know, I'm a part of this community, I'm going to contribute to this community, a lot of give and take, to becoming, this is us, and you work for us, and you're giving us free labor. The second you cross that line, you're in trouble. Uh, and, and that's actually one of the funny things. Uh, I've had companies where my sales teams were not allowed to talk to our developers at all. Um, you know, if a developer reached out to a sales uh, guy, that's perfectly fine. I've had other companies, uh, you know, MuleSoft and Ring Central are two great, great examples where uh, our sales team would come to developer events. And they came to developer events because they want to be part of the community. They understood that the developer wasn't going to be the decision maker who's going to you know, sign a million dollar contract or buy a brand new phone system for their, uh, you know, their company. But they saw the value of that community. Uh, and they would start having these conversations. And so they could build that trust, build that respect. And then the developer would be the one going, hey, I really think this could you know, benefit our company. Why don't you talk to so-and-so? So again, when I say that if you can't sell to your community, it's not a community problem, it's a company problem. What I mean by that, it's how mm. you're engaging the community and how you're approaching the community. And again, if it's not symbiotic. If you're not going with the mindset that we're here to help developers. Uh, when I was at MuleSoft, when we built our community, we actually had a rule that we would not do anything that did not benefit developers directly. Mm. Uh, and, and so one of the big challenges there is we decided to ask them for ratings and reviews on, on MuleSoft's technology. That was our big test is even asking for like, would you rate us on G2 Crowd or Captera was like, are we crossing a line? Turned out no, because we built that trust, we built that relationship. They're like, yeah, I'll rate you and what else can we do to support you? But again, that was our first rule. Whatever we do has to support the developer, has to help the developer, has to help them in their career. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind, uh, and, and I'll stop talking, um, which will be a first for me, uh, <laughs> is that when you're marketing your company, when you're getting involved with the community, the real competition for your developers is not your competitor. It's time with their family. It's time with their friends. It's watching Netflix. It's spending time with their kids. It's learning new technologies. So there has to be really good reason for them to be involved in your community and spending time focusing on you versus all those, those other things. Interesting perspective. Thanks, Dave. You kind of jumped in there kind of early. So you want to give us your perspective? I was joking. No, uh, <laughs> you know, I think when I first started in um, dev advocacy, I was very much on the sort of like anti-selling, anti sort of pushing product and just focus on the technology and education. And I still have a lot of respect for people who do that. But I remember one time I was hosting a meetup. I was working for a, a startup called PubNub. 
And uh, I gave my sort of like intro presentation. The main presenter gave their presentation. And then afterwards, I was like, OK, good night, everybody. And then I was talking to somebody afterwards. And they were like, so what is PubNub? And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I'm doing my job very poorly right now. If you came to the office, you know, like you RSVP to the meetup, you came to the office, and I didn't tell you what the company does. So developers do have a certain amount of latent interest in your company, your product, the best practices that you use to engineer your product and sort of like what it does. Mm. And you're doing them a bit of a disservice if you ignore that completely. So there, there's a certain amount of, uh, of education that you have to do about your company and product. Yeah. Anything to add? So I would say, I mean, I'm sure we all have products in our house and software that we use that we absolutely love. Instant pot. That we've told people about, right? Like, oh, you got, you know, I use this software and like, you're so excited that someone's actually going to listen to how you s configured blah, 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 and set it up, right? So we have these things that we do love. And so, you know, the uh, most authentic way to do developer relations and experience is to plug into solving those problems and getting people excited, right? I mean, it's not, um, selling is just a way to connect to make sure that the people who really want your stuff and will get excited about your stuff find out about it. So, you know, I think th that's that's where I try to ground myself. And like the fact that I even ended up v at VMware was that at the time, I was sort of trying to figure out what to do and I'd found this role and my partner at the time, um, now he does partner engineering stuff, but he mm -hmm. was a software engineer. And I said, oh, uh, you know, what's this company, VMware? And he was like, oh, my God, Workstation, so amazing. He went on for 30 minutes, like, I love Workstation. This is why it's so great. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. he, he was evangelizing, right? I mean, he, and at some point, probably somebody sold him that product. He, you know, he found out about it and all that. But it's a joyful experience. So, like, you know, don't think we have to be that shy about that when we, that's the meaningful connection we're trying to make, where people totally understand the value of, um, what they're paying for and sometimes they even feel like ah, you know They're not charging me enough for this thing. That's just so life-changing and you know They might donate if there's like a side project or they might, might want to help in certain ways um, And so like in our case right now like the whole last year we would do this Thursday series and I was like eh, Let's do these office hours on like if you're an app developer and you're thinking about Kubernetes, like what kinds of topics, you know, would be of concern for you? And these people would just come every week and they're really small, really small conversation groups, slow burn. And in fast forward, I, I see this email and there's this guy who's like, cause he's just like, we have no money, we have no money. And finally he's just like, see this email thread, there's like a chief architect involved and he's just like, totally like, we got to buy from these people. <laughs> they are so great and their product is great. And this and that, I just thought, you know, we were just providing a service yeah. and they loved us and you know they're advocating for us i have to poll the audience i know i can i can see your hand so you don't have to turn the lights on how many of you would love it if people told you that they need to pay you more for your products <laughs> how, yeah valuable right that's a lot of value built in right that's real world stuff so i think you know if we're talking about improving the bottom line that's a great way to do it and a common thread between what the three of you were saying was building trust with the people in your community, back to the relationships thing. And you got right into one of the next topics, which is advocacy or champions or, or whatever you want to call it. So running programs and, and building that trust with your developer community, um, tell me a little bit about how you think about community champions or advocates. I mean, Tamao, Tama, you just talked a little bit about that. Um, and when do you gamify that? How do you codify that status there's the word that I wanted to get you with. How do you codify that status? And how do you manage those relationships with those advocates or champions once they get there? Yeah. Um, I might have a longer answer later, but yeah, the gamification part, I know people use certain tools and they think it works and all that. It's great, you know, if it works for them, it's great. But for me, I've been quite allergic to that and I feel that it can take away from the joy and, you know, there's actually studies on like, you know, you get this clear uptick in the beginning because everybody else is getting gamified and they're all collecting badges and then they get uh, badge fatigue, which is what I call it. Mm. <laughs> you know, because like then what's the meaning? I kind of, uh, I got into this in the short term, but like if you're building a long-term relationship, you know, there's just so many more meaningful ways that you can thank your champions and um, uh, build relationships with them and then basically create a platform for them to um, amplify what they already want to naturally amplify. 
Um, and so the, the main thing I guess I would add there is um, I've noticed that some people like get into very complicated like ways of thinking about how they're going to think of you know thank their champions and I keep telling them like the most meaningful thing a lot of times is just saying thank you yeah. you know Agreed. and you don't have to mail them a physical thing you don't have to you know it's like it's the recognition that matters it's not the object because I think a lot of people's like oh we need 10 grand because we're going to mail everybody something just being genuine yeah it's just yeah. like do this do the stuff that means something and then the objects are right. something that would follow so especially if you have a really tight budget like that's mm, you know that's the advice that I've always given yeah. Dave, what do you think about champions and advocates in, in your world? Um, it's, it's a little bit scary because, you know, you go out there as a dev advocate and you look at all the advocates who are out there in the community and you're like, oh my gosh, every one of these people is smarter than me. Like, why am I getting paid to do this? You know, because the community out there is just amazing. We get mm -hmm. people from the community to give talks at our meetups and conferences and stuff like that. And they're just really, really smart. So a, a lot of my role <laughs> is just facilitating them. You know, like, what can I do for you right. to, make, to make your job easier? Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, so I, I think I'm the, I feel a bit the same way about the gamification stuff and, and you know, physical objects um, because um, a lot of it is just, that, you know, they're doing it because they, they like your product. They feel that you're relating to them authentically. Uh, and so commoditizing that is a double-edged sword. Yeah. Interesting. All right, I'm going to get myself in trouble on this one now. No, come on. Uh, based on those answers. Uh, no, so who, I think there's, who would believe otherwise? Who wants to use these We need multiple viewpoints. There you go. Give us one. He so uh, at MuleSoft, we, we ran the MuleSoft Champions program, which was very heavily gamification uh, mm -hmm. using third-party software. Uh, but it goes back down to, again, making sure you're doing what's right by the developers. And so we offered those tangible prizes that we'd ship out. We actually gave away things like uh, iPad minis, MacBook Pros, uh, that developers could earn. And what we found is we had a lot of people who joined the program initially just because they wanted to earn that prize. Uh, but our entire goal of the program wasn't to say, oh, tweet about us, write about us, and we'll send you a MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm. Our entire program was designed to say, we're going to help you grow your career and help you do the things that I wish somebody would help me do when I start off as a developer mm -hmm. to le learn how to grow my career. Mm -hmm. And so we had people join. And uh, one of my favorite comments that came back was, you know, I joined this program just for the fun of it. I just wanted to get a prize, earn some badges, get some points. This is one of the best educational programs I've ever been a part of. Mm. And that was what really struck us as kind of the, the winning factor. And we talked about the value from that. Uh, the last year at MuleSoft, uh, we had about $2 million worth of content created by the external community uh, through that program. Uh, the cost to administer that program was less than a single developer evangelist. Uh, so, I mean, we look at that. Uh, actually, it's kind of funny. I had a conversation with uh, Rob Spector uh, before he had left uh, Twilio. And he was talking about the, the great work that his team was doing. Like, hey, look, we did all this great work. We got, you know, uh, I think we did like 156 blog posts. Uh, we did this, we did this. And I think he had a team of uh, eight at the time. I don't remember exactly. And he turned to me, he goes, he goes, now, Mike, your team's pretty small. You have like three people. How'd you guys do for content? I'm like, well, we had 5,760 uh, blog posts. We had uh, about 500 videos. We had another 300 tutorials. And Rob just kind of shook his head at me and, and laughed. And, you know, but the point is, the community <laughs> could be really valuable to you, but you can provide a value to them without making it be, oh, here, give us something, take this, we want nothing to do with you. Uh, in fact, many of those people who join that Gamify program uh, are good friends of mine now on Facebook or LinkedIn because you continue to build that relationship with them. Uh, in terms of building a, a championship program, them or MVP program, I don't like traditional MVP programs, which mm. is, hey, you're our top three people, congratulations, the rest of you, you're all peons, like, you, you know, you're not as good as they are. <clears throat> and that's not the message that's trying to be sent, but sometimes that's the message that does get sent, and it's intimidating because people say, wow, I want to contribute, I want to be part of this community, I want to be like Dave, I want to be like uh, Tomo, but I can't do all this stuff, I'm not smart enough, or I don't know enough, or I don't have the time. In fact, with MuleSoft, uh, we, we brought in a guy into our uh, Gamify program here, and I talked to my uh, engineers like, oh yeah, we, we see him on Stack Overflow once or twice. Uh, you know, he's, he's not very strong. Half the time his answers are wrong. Like, he's probably not gonna be able to contribute much. Uh, two and a half years later when I left MuleSoft, uh, I was at Connect Central uh, for the last time, and the engineer came to me and goes, is this guy gonna be here? And I said, no, you know, we, we couldn't fly him in. He goes, he, goes, he goes, that guy is my hero. He has single-handedly done more than anybody else in this uh, community. And again, this is a guy who created, I think he by himself created around 400 blog posts. He created tutorial videos. 
Why? Because he had the opportunity to learn, the opportunity to grow. And it wasn't that we gave him prizes. Yes, he loved the prizes. Uh, but it was that we gave him the chance to grow his career. Mm. And he now works at a company as a MuleSoft developer, as a senior MuleSoft developer, because of that opportunity. That's a great point. And it's really cool to see how developers like to give back in community. We talked a little bit about being you know, genuine and upfront and just saying thank you. And those things go a really long way, just like they do in real life with other humans, right? Um, so I know we're running short on time, and we want to give uh, those people in the room the opportunity to ask us some questions. So I have one other question for the panelists, and we'll make this a fun one. Um, as, as you all can see by the answers and the experience and the stories that these three are bringing to you, there's, there's a depth of experience here. Now, if you're from where I'm from, experience just means you've made more mistakes than everybody else, right? So I want to talk a little bit about your failures and what you learned from them. So if you could, <laughs> so if you could think of, and I don't want all your failures, please. We don't have all evening. I uh, want to talk about um, you know, some of the times when some experiments you've tried uh, or you had a, a big negative impact when you were trying to build your community or something that didn't go right that you think would be helpful uh, for the audience as they start to build out their own developer communities, some things that they want to watch out for. And Dave, I know this is a topic near and dear to your heart. I feel like all that I've done this evening is talk about things that I've failed at. <laughs> Talks that nobody attended, forums that nobody used. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sure I've done some And give us, a, give us a tip, something tangible they can take away with them before we get into their Don't questions. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, well, okay, so... So you're going to fail, uh, and you're going to fail a lot. And that's why it's important to measure things, right? Um, because you have to, you know, when, when you throw a bunch of darts at the board, some of them are going to hit, and those are the ones that you want to double down on. Uh, and some of them are just going to go off, and you just have to forgive yourself and, uh, and keep going. Uh, and that could be, you know, sort of like how you sell the products, uh, the technology areas that you're, that you're going after developers in, the types of developers, the size of the company, how you move people from your, from your advocacy, uh, from community to advocacy to your sales pipeline, um, so many things. So, so everything you do, um, measure it. Uh, and, uh, and then, hopefully, <laughs> that will lead you to some success. Uh, and then you can look back uh, and joke about your failures <laughs> instead of uh, On instead stage of in crying. front of a bunch of other people, that <laughs> yeah, nice. I cry in private. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Mike, why don't you go next? Uh, I think I kind of piggyback off of what you said there. Uh, I think one of the, the biggest failures for myself, and then also I think in DevRel, is not marketing to developers, but marketing to your own company, explain to your company <laughs> what you're doing. Hmm. Uh, so to your point really quickly, measure everything. You should have a developer journey funnel for your company that can track. You know, things like you know, awareness to interest, to consideration, to adoption, all the way to advocacy. Let, you'll be able to say exactly where the problems are. Uh, as Dave said, be willing to be agile. You're gonna have things that don't work, be able to move very quickly. But also keep in mind that your company is very interested in what you're doing and make sure that you're staying in touch with the stakeholders, sharing with the stakeholders, and putting a dollar value to what you do. Even if you can't put a, a hard dollar value, letting them know here's the value we're seeing from the community. Here's the value we're seeing. Because at the end of the day, I wish I could say everybody at the company is going to be super altruistic and, and it's like, yes, the community is the most important thing and we're going to support that uh, versus making this next million dollar sale. Hmm. It doesn't always work that way. But if you can go to them and say, here's the value, it gives the company a reason to invest more in the community because at the end of the day, the company wants to make more money. <laughs> um, and also, I think the last thing I throw on there in terms of a personal failure is... Yeah, I don't want to hear about the personal failure. Well, these are all personal failures. Like, I, I've gone and helped the funnel. I've gone in and not justified it. Um, and that's the thing. A lot of companies expect that you're going to start this community tomorrow. You're going to have a million developers. Uh, it doesn't work that way. In fact, every uh, job I've taken, I've said, look, in the first year, you're actually not going to see any ROI. Like, it's going to take a year before you even start seeing ROI. It's going to take another year before I start putting real tangible dollar values that you can measure against uh, for this. Uh, but the other thing is, sometimes it gets very easy to f fall on one side or the other. In community, you have responsibility to both the community and to the company. And you have to, you know, there's a very uh, thin, tight rope that you have to walk there. You have to make sure that you're supporting and protecting the community from the company, but you also make sure that you're protecting the company from the community. And, and that's, again, a very strong relationship for both. And sometimes it's very easy to lean one way or the other and, you know, argue with your boss and tell them, no, we're not doing this, or no, sales isn't important, not that I'd ever right. say that. Uh, or, you know, I don't understand why marketing does. So be very careful in walking that and understand that there's always two sides, and, and your job is to really interpret that and navigate that. Awesome. 
But was that and good enough, Dave? I can go into more if you'd like. In terms but of that was good enough. Tom, uh, why don't you wrap it up for us and uh, answer this, and we'll start to get some questions. Yeah, I guess I'll address a lot of people here talking about online communities, and um, it's not necessarily failure or, or success, but you know, be aware of what platform is best. So, like, I I've seen companies where you know they are desperately trying to have their own forum work, but everybody was at Stack Overflow. So it was like, why are we working so hard to draw everybody to our tiny little pond when they're mm -hmm. out there in the ocean, right? And they had to <coughs> change that mentality. Um, or other people who do find actually a huge amount of success with their own discourse, you know, and the way that they engage. So, like, they had a model that worked for them. Uh, I've seen other models where they're using discourse and they're like struggling to get engineering time to just make the plugins work and all that, you know, I would yeah. say that that's definitely not a super success. Slack's not perfect, but you know, they're just, I think sometimes if you're just getting started, like just go for the easiest thing where you can engage with people and then, you know, figure out what you think might be the best for your product and what your needs are instead of like start thinking up front how much money you're going to spend to like build something that m you might end up having to shut down in a couple of years. Awesome. Yeah. Great. All right, now we'll uh, open it up. Mina, if you'll walk around, I know somebody right here in the front very eager to ask a question to us, the panelists, so please. <laughs> I, I think the first thing you can do is start reaching out and talking to them. You know, say, hey, we know you're using the, uh, the, this product. We'd love your feedback. We'd love to you know, invite you to like a, uh, a you know, office hours type thing. Um, that's a good way to make them uh, understand they have an impact on the, the product's future, that they connect with you. And also, again, your focus should be on the relationship, not the lead. So that'd, that'd be the first thing. Uh, the second thing is start finding ways that you can work with them. So it can be a one-on-one -on -one where you're saying, hey, look, you know, we really love your experience. Would you be willing to write a, a blog post on this? Would you be willing to do a guest blog on our blog? Again, you're highlighting them, you're giving them an opportunity to build their reputation, but also letting them share their knowledge. And that goes, uh, as you can eventually build, you can start getting more formal programs in. But really, you want to find those people who are going to be your, your top advocates who, are, as you launch your community program, are going to be the cornerstones of what you're building. Cool. Yeah, and uh, if they can't do a blog post, uh, it could be like a technical integration um, or an, in, an interview if it's uh, somebody non-technical. Um, but also, you know, I would just ask, like, how are you currently interacting with your developers? Um, what works? It, it, even if it's just email, um, you know, double down on the stuff that works. Um, mm -hmm. Don't try to craft something from scratch. Yeah. Uh, to piggyback, I'd say, you know, everybody has different modes in which they like to communicate, so have those different modes available, whether it's Slack or through a regular call or, you know, some other means that um, just have those different channels available so that people can communicate in their time zone and in the method that they prefer. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I would echo that. Build the relationships and go where they are. Meet them where they are and, and build that relationship. If only there was a software company that you could speak to that. <laughs> I, I don't think any of the panelists have any idea, but maybe our moderator. <laughs> maybe the sponsor. Yeah, there is there's definitely purpose-built software out there for it, for definite sure. I would love to talk to you right after. Yes, the answer is yes. The, the to answer to ruin your yes. sales pitch, uh, really quickly, just because I'm going to get myself uh -huh. in trouble. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay you later. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of great tools out there. Uh, you know, there, we mentioned there's tools... Uh, you know, Answer Hub specifically, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not, but it's a tremendous form solution. Uh, I use it at MuleSoft, we use it at RingCentral, absolutely great product. Um, you know, there's tools we mentioned for gamification, there's, uh, you know, you can do tools, you can use Slack or uh, Glip from RingCentral for team messaging. I'm, ge I'm getting paid for being up here now, I'm, I'm doing all the sponsored things. You're getting paid? Well, well not, not really. <laughs> You're not? I'm missing out. Uh, no, uh, but you need to find the right tools for your community. Right. You know, so it may be something where you can look at, you know, IBM and say, wow, they have all this stuff. Chances are if you're a startup, you're not ready for all the stuff that IBM has, and you're not going to, you, know, you've got, you guys have a great community. Like, you, you've built, like, this amazing thing. Um, Thanks, man. But you'll find the tools, uh, again, to Tomato's point of how your community is uh, already interacting with you. Use those tools first, start with that, and then you can expand and build. Uh, and there's a lot of great open source tools you can start with uh, until your company's matured or you've matured to the point of saying, okay, I'm ready to really commit to this and, and purchase, you know, uh, a more expensive tooling. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say is no matter what tool you use, those relationships and that work to actually develop programs and be where the developers are, you still have to do all that stuff. A tool is only going to take you so far. So being able to think through a lot of the things we talked about on health and, and vibrancy and meeting the developers where they are, that relationship building is you got to do that stuff on your own too. 
So I, I think the first thing with any community program, when you start building the community program, you have to understand where your company stands in that community. Um, you know, in the case of Ring Central, I'll pick on them, a great company. Uh, they're actually the, you know, the leader in cloud communications. Yet you know, when I go to developers, like, oh, are you guys the doorbell company? Uh, or uh, the other one that I got that I absolutely enjoyed was just, I love you guys, you're amazing. I sent a fax with you like 18 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Um, <laughs> And so in the case of Ring Central, some people know that, one, we have an API, we have these capabilities, and you, know, you can do a lot more with communications than just make a phone call. With MuleSoft, MuleSoft had gone from being open source to enterprise, and we had a lot of developers that felt like we betrayed that trust when we took their code that they wrote, mm. packaged it up, and started selling it. Mm. Um, and so when we looked at MuleSoft, we had a lot of different issues. We looked at our forum, uh, we had a 35% response rate. And uh, you know, basically three out of every 10 questions I got an answer, most of those were you should contact support. Not very helpful. Uh, we had a lot of people, again, who were very upset with us. And so we started uh, talking to different members, trying to understand what's the underlying root problem. And we decided that the problem wasn't that our forum was the wrong software, or people weren't engaged there. The problem was that they weren't interested in what we were doing, they'd lost that trust in us, and they didn't feel that they had a voice anymore. So we went to people, uh, we, we, uh, Ross Mason who founded MuleSoft had originally just dubbed 10 MuleSoft champions, he just like, you're a champion, you're a champion. We went to them, we asked their feedback. We wanted to respect that they were the original champions, grandfather them in. We talked to people, we posted on the forum, we asked for other people's feedback in the community. Uh, I sent a lot of emails to people saying, hey, what do you think? And just by doing that, I naturally started to find the people who are gonna be you know, the right people to help restart, uh, restart this community. Um, and then one of my favorite ones is when we launched the, uh, the champions program, uh, I got a uh, forum post uh, from an individual, and it was about probably four or five pages long uh, about how I had single-handedly just killed the MuleSoft community. Uh, and what he said was, you started this, the forum's not working, this isn't working, you're, here's all these issues, he goes, you don't know what you're doing, you, know, you, you basically destroyed what was left, you should be ashamed of yourself. And so I reached out to him. And I said, hey, you know, I understand that this is really frustrating. I understand that you're going through this. Again, developers want to know that they're being heard and they want honesty and integrity. And I said, here's the deal. Try it out for a month. If you don't like it, let's talk. And if it's not making the community better, we'll kill it. Like, I'm going to give you that power. A um, month later, and this is the only time this has ever happened in my life, I received an email from a developer with an apology. Um, I've never seen that before. And, and that individual actually became one of our top uh, champions and, and one of our greatest uh, you know, advocates for the program. Now what we did for the program is we looked at what we thought were the problems. We thought the problem was, look, th there's only so many finite influencers in the community to begin with. And a lot of companies say, okay, there's 100 influencers, let's go after the, that 100 influencers. And what happens is you have all four of us going after 100 people, maybe I get 20, he gets 30, you, know, you get 30, uh, Jesse gets the other 20. And we keep fighting to keep them. We wanted to give people the chance to grow and become an influencer in the community. So we wanted to create new thought leaders, new experts. And so we segmented the challenges based on their expertise, where it was, you know, you, are you familiar with ESBs? You know, have you worked with MuleSoft? How would you rate yourself? And we made it fun. It wasn't like, I'm you know, a senior software engineer. It was, you know, I'm a MuleSoft ninja. Uh, and then based on that, they got challenges that were specifically designed to help them build their reputation and grow their skills. So there were some things like, read blog posts, uh, we, we used a lot of gamification, so here's a bunch of free points, you know, give a bunch of points for this. Um, and then it was things like, you know, use your first app, write your first app, so they got a chance to understand how to do it, give us feedback. Uh, walk in a way to, you know, ask a question on the forum, uh, help someone on the forum. And, and I credit a little bit of this to... Not your full plan, your abbreviated plan. My abbreviated plan, Your sorry. abbreviated plan. Well, this I was, this, I was this just is the longest I, answer ever. I was going to say, I credit a lot of this to uh, <laughs> Answer Hub, because we switched our form to that, but we actually went from a 35% response rate to, and I've never seen this in my life before, a 99% response rate with our forum, and we tripled the number of posts. Um, but the idea is, again, give them challenges or help them grow, take them from where they are to where they want to be, and help them become that leader in the community. And again, you can do prizes, you can you know, do badges, People are going to join because they either want the prize, they want the fun and the competition, uh, or they want the recognition. You know, and that's, that's what you can really help. And what with. I really liked about your answer in there is it, it's relationship building. Back to that thing we keep coming at, you know, community, whether it's online or in person, it's about bringing people together, letting them connect and giving them somewhere they can belong. And so if you do that, you won't go wrong. Super quickly, yeah. you should start your champions program on day one. And your champions program, just like I said earlier, say thank you, mm -hmm. right? Um, tweet, yep. out, tweet out uh, something that 
something cool that somebody's done in your community. Um, sometimes we'll find out like, oh, you're in our city. You know, like we're kind of we're really small, but we're quite distributed. Right. So we'll find out like, like the guy in Berlin is going to go have coffee with somebody in our community because they're like, oh, we're both in Berlin. That's you really know, like. Cool. You don't have to have this whole, you know, platform and a program. Your your program is to make sure that you have that perspective deeply embedded in not just hopefully your developer relations team, but your whole company where you're saying thank you. And you know, if you're all at the same conference, like, oh, well, hey, let's let's say hello. You know, just recognizing and creating connections. Awesome, great answers. I hope that that helped. Good question, Tom. Yeah. You're like you're about to answer. I just so. say you get free trial trialists. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way. Is, is your uh, is your product like? Are your customers technical, like developers, or yeah, are they? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So then I, I think it almost doesn't matter if it's if it's open source or closed source, right? Because they're going to be having issues. Uh, no offense, they're going to be having issues. Yeah, you know, yeah. using your product, <laughs> integrating with your product, integrating your product with their product, writing middleware and glue code and stuff like that. And so they're going to be asking questions and getting support in a similar way to the way that they would in an open source project. And so it's your responsibility to curate a community that helps solve those problems. Uh, it, it, it's an interesting question because uh, the other week I had a, a friend reach out. He's doing a startup. And he said, look, we're creating this product. He goes, we don't have anything done yet. We just have a, a mock-up. Would you come and take a look at it? And I came in and I looked at it. And I was like, this is amazing. I was able to give feedback. I was able to interact. And I'll tell you, I'm going to be the first person to buy that product when it comes out. I'm also going to be the first person singing its praises. Just by doing that, that simple step of saying, look, it's not out yet, but involving people, getting that feedback, you're starting to build that community. And then when he launches, I guess I'm going to be on Twitter, I'm going to be writing blog posts about it. Uh, and just like you know, Goat Yoga, it hopefully becomes viral, and you know, people will talk about it as well. So uh, you know, Ring Central is the same boat. We're an API. You know, that's what I focus on. We don't have an open source project. It, uh, as they've said, it's a service, and so you can evolve them and, and treat very differently. It's just the asks are slightly different, and you're going to have to change some of the approaches, but yeah, absolutely evolve them as, as soon as possible. I think that every interaction that you get with a user of your software is an opportunity to build community, right? When we break it down into the, the fundamentals of the human relationship, every time that you help someone with a bug, um, any time that you can write a piece of documentation, something they can read together, if you make that something that they can contribute to as well, uh, anything that you do, every interaction that you get with one of the users of your software is an opportunity to build community. So I think if we, if we change that and think about it that way, um, in building groups of people using our software, developers specifically, uh, and helping them in any way that we can, I think we'll, we'll do all right. Thanks uh, to the HeavyBit team uh, for hosting us this evening. It was awesome. Thanks to each one of you for sharing part of your evening with us. Uh, we appreciate it, and thanks to uh, our panelists, my friends, and uh, colleagues in the community space, thanks so much for showing up. Give them a hand. Thanks. Thanks.